Hello, everybody. Welcome to the final bar. What a week we had here at the New York Stock Exchange. The bell just rang behind me. The debt ceiling worries are over. Job numbers are out. We're going to recap that week and see what's moving markets. Thank you for joining us. This is the final bar. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's uh, the final bar, our Friday episode. Uh, my name is Jay Woods. I'm the chief global strategist at Freedom Capital Markets here at the New York Stock Exchange, filling in for Dave Keller, or quite honestly, trying to fill in for Dave Keller. It's going to be a little different today. I don't have all the bells and whistles that uh, he's accustomed to having in front of him. And you know what? I look at things a little differently, and hopefully you can appreciate that. Uh, we got that break above the 4,200 level, that psychological, technical level in the S&P 500 people have been talking about for weeks. We saw expansion of breath, uh, and we ended on a very high note. So uh, let's get into a wrap the week segment and take a deeper dive. So we're on our dashboard here, and I'm going to try to emulate my friend Dave Keller and just review some of the things we saw this week. First in the equity space, the Dow Jones Industrial Average held a very important 200-day moving average. It wasn't talked about enough because too many people were focusing on the S&P 500, but the Dow closed up an amazing 700 points, 2.1% to close at 33,762. Watch 34,000. That's the next level of resistance, and I have a feeling we may be testing that next week. Then, of course, the S&P 500, that's what everyone's been talking about. When they say the market, let's face it, that's what they're talking about. 4,200, we got there. We closed above there barely last Friday. We had debt ceiling concerns. We had a three-day weekend. We got through the debt ceiling. We got through a jobs number, and we got momentum. And we got momentum in the S&P 500. It was up 1.5%, not the leader. I like that. And guess what also wasn't the leader? The NASDAQ. The NASDAQ was up 139 points, a great day, up 1%, but it wasn't what led. We saw expansion in the breadth. Uh, the NYSE index, which we have here on our stock charts portfolio, I've worked here for 31 years. I don't know what it is. We don't pay attention to it. But for those that do, it was up 2%. Where I do pay attention are the mid cap and the small cap. We saw the S&P mid cap hold another critical level of support and rally 3% on the day. And to top that off, the Russell had a great day and the S&P 600 small cap index was up another 4%. This is great breadth. This is what we want to see as we expand and break out to new highs in the S&P 500. The S&P 100 up 1.2%. Uh, and the VIX, you know, the VIX is uh, just dragging down lower, down 6.5%. We, we are appreciative of a low VIX because that means equities are doing well. Equities, my specialty, but let's not forget the bond market. Let's see what was moving today. The 30-year was up 1.2%. The 10-year yield up 2.3%. The five-year up 3.8%. Uh, and then 20-plus-year 20 20 year Treasury bonds, uh, they were down. Uh, just under 102, close at 101.99, up down 1.1%. And then the dollar. Dollar, you know, pretty resilient here, up 1%. Uh, closing at 28.56. Now let's look at commodities. Commodities have been very volatile. Uh, gold, yeah, that 200 level had been something that we thought would break above. It didn't. It failed and it was down today. I like to see gold act poorly when the markets and equities are showing strength. Silver down 1.2%. Copper, which we're going to talk about later on in the final bar when we get to the mailbag segment. Copper up half a percent. It's almost $23. Oil Bouncing off some of those lows, you know, summer driving season, we don't want to see oil do so great, but we did get a nice bounce in energy stocks. Oil led the way up 2.5%. Natural gas, a stock that's personally been killing me, where a sector, the UNG, uh, closed just below six, uh, almost up a percent on the day. And then corn, uh, you know, summer season, we like corn up 1.3%. 
Now, here's something I don't focus on. So I apologize for my lack of knowledge in the crypto space. I do know Bitcoin. I do know Ethereum. I own a little there. Uh, they had nice rallies as well. Bitcoin, we saw it fail at 30,000. It closed at 27,268, up 1.65%. Ethereum, up 2.5%. And then we've got some coins. Litecoin, I know. We don't have Doge on this, Dave. I don't know why we don't have Doge. Doge, I have some teenagers who like Doge. But, uh, you know, across the space, we've seen some rally, not just in equities, but in the crypto space. What I'm focusing on, what our theme is today, is market breadth. And let's look at the sectors. Um, today, materials, energy, industrials led. These were three of our biggest laggards. It's good to see them come up and uh, lead. And what failed? Well, let's see. Nothing failed. All 11 sectors were up on the day. The laggards, though, communications and technologies. These were the leaders. This is healthy rotation. This is what you want to see. The stocks that people were buying, they didn't go up. But they didn't get hurt. And where do we rotate into some of the weaker sectors? Now, let's look at the weak in the sectors that were. And see, bear with me. Technology, not my friend. But we saw strength in consumer discretionary anyway. Over the week, it was still up 3.3%. Real estate, one of the most beaten down sectors, up 3.1%. Materials, industrials, up 2%. Materials, industrials, healthcare, financials. This is strong movement. This is strong breath. This is something we want to see in a bull market. People complain 10 stocks were leading us this whole time. Well, let's let's see how it continues into next week. But this is what we want to see when we're looking at sector rotation. Let's go back to the dashboard, shall we? Um, I want to get into uh, one thing that people weren't talking about. Let me go to my final bar notes. Uh, we talk about Dow theory. We talk about what leads. A lot of people look at technology. I look at the transports. I look at the industrials. And right now, the transports are one sector that's not getting enough attention. We're going to talk about it at the end on three and three. But the transports held a key support level here, 13,500, broken intermediate short term downtrend with a nice pop. And where did it pop? It popped above key moving averages. And this is what I like the most. We had a nice divergence in the RSI showing when it was making those lows relative strength was actually improving. This is the kind of things I want to see. And then if we scroll down a little lower, the MACD, we're starting to see some positive crossovers here. Not perfect, but it's something that I like to look at. So watch the transports and then the industrials. Let's take a look at the industrials here. And you're getting a peek at the other things you're going to see during the show. The industrials, what do we do? We broke relative support, the RSI. Nice little pop today. Nice pop overall. 700 points will do that. But what I mentioned earlier in the show, we held key moving averages. It was back a week ago. We had an intraday break of the 200-day moving average. Is it a line in the sand? No, it's not. But it's something we watch. In fact, that's a little tease for the mailbag. We talk about the importance of the 200 and the 50-day and why people like me and people that trade down here focus you know, nicely on those averages. But the industrials held, it has room to run. And then, you know what, as we talked about 4,200 in the S&P 500, guess what we'll be talking about next week? We're going to be talking about resistance levels in the Dow. So that is it on our dashboard. I have one more thing, Dave Keller. Yeah, he just real quick, I wanted to show advances versus decliners, improving breadth. Uh, that is one of the things we see. Stocks over the 50-day moving average. So part of me, as I scroll down, Dave has got so much great information here. I apologize for not being as great as him. But let's focus right now on this. S&P 500, stocks that are trading above the 50-day moving average. We crossed the 50% threshold. This is positive. This is bullish. We're seeing nice momentum lift all boats. And then let's look at the index itself. Here was that 4,200, that line in the sand. It broke out. It's trading above 4,200. Now, if we sell off, we're going to watch that again. We're going to talk about 4,200, where old resistance becomes support. That's what we'll be watching in the week ahead. But what we want to focus now, it's Friday. It's time for Mailbag. I want to answer the questions that you guys are asking and uh, do a deeper dive in some of those questions because they do have relevance to what we're seeing in the market. So when we come back after this commercial break, we'll get into the Mailbag.
Welcome back, everyone. Once again, I'm I'm Jay Woods from Freedom Capital Markets here at the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, a little different today, but one thing that's not different, we're going to continue with our final mailbag, where I will answer questions from you, the audience. But first, I want to share how you can get your questions answered on the air. Our email address at the final bar is the final bar at stockcharts.com. You can tweet us, and that's my preference of reaching out to people at final bar. SCTV, or you can just put a comment below if you're watching on YouTube. We welcome the, the likes, the subscriptions, and the comments in the YouTube. And I know a lot of you are watching this on Saturday, but please reach out. You know, no question, we'll go unanswered. I just put Dave Keller on the spot with that. So now you have to hold him to it. But please feel free to reach out. And now let's get to the mailbag. Let's get to your questions. Question number one. All right. I don't like all these questions, but we're going to answer them. Uh, do you use copper to gauge the strength of the S&P 500? Well, maybe Dave Keller does, but you're, you're asking Jay Woods, do I use copper? I don't, but it is important. And I want to show some of the relationship because copper does have a strong relationship to the S&P 500. So what I have here is just the last two years, three years actually, going back post-COVID to show the relationship. That blue line is the S&P 500. And is it rally copper rally? Did copper lead? Yeah, copper led for a little while. And then it got hit. The market sold off. Rates went up. Um, do I use it? No. What do I use as far as indicators for the S&P 500? It tends to change. Last year, there was a strong correlation with the U.S. dollar. The dollar was the index that was leading us. As the dollar went, so did the S&P 500. Copper, yes, it has a strong correlation because there's increased demand for copper typically during a growing economy, but COVID kind of changed it. And COVID uh, is definitely, you know, something that has changed how we look at things. And when we got into this raising rate environment, uh, copper began to slide as interest rates hiked, fears rose about a global recession, and, uh, you know, the correlation seemed to dampen. Are we going to see it again? Yeah, we're starting to see it but it's not what I use. Uh, it's definitely a question I would love to pose to Dave because I will now go to the mailbag and say, hey, Dave, I was asked if I use copper as a correlation. I don't, but maybe you do. And that brings us to our second question. Our second question is, is one of my favorites. Uh, why do so many people use the 50 and the 200 day moving average? Well, let's show you a basic chart of, you know, we're going to keep it simple here at the final bag. The, the 50 and the 200 day, those are, Basic technical analysis 101. They give you a gen general idea of the pattern of the trend. So let's click on this. See, I'm not as good as Dave Keller, but I am good at reading 50 day and 200 day moving average. This is a long term view of the SP 500. All right, that red line is your 200 day moving average. That blue line is the 50 day. If you're an active trader like I used to be for years down here at the New York Stock Exchange, it's a great guide for long-term pivots, but for the, the near-term in investor, the near-term day trader, no, you're using quicker moving averages. You one minute, five minute VWAP trading averages. I, I applaud all that do. I used to do it when I was trading day to day. But when you're a market analyst like I have become, you wanna look at the bigger picture first and then break it down. And there's no thing, there's nothing like the 200 day to give you an idea of which way the trend is going. And it acts as a natural support system. Is it support? Do I buy it every time? No. But there have been years, and we had it recently two years ago, where the 50-day, the blue line, acted as support. We continued to climb consistently up it. And then what happened? When it changed. People talk about golden crosses. A golden cross is when the 50-day moving average, like we see in the blue line, crosses above the 200-day moving average, when it rises above. For long-term trend followers, this is one, it's a lagging indicator for a short-termer, but it shows you that something has changed. And if you bought here and you rode it until the death cross, all right, you had a nice gain over the long-term. That's not a bad thing. The death cross, that can be quicker. As we saw here, uh, this was uh, December, 2018. This was COVID. The death cross is a lagging indicator. And by the time you get that golden cross, if you sold it, you didn't hit the play, but the golden cross over time will act as a great way to see that something has changed. And guess what? We had a golden cross already here in 2023 to begin the year. And what have we done ever since? We've trended up. So the 50 to 200 day, they're great for trend followers, 
for those long-term trends. Um, I do reference it a lot when I talk about the overall market. I reference it today in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Last week when the Dow, and we'll go back to that chart if you're just patient with me. Let's look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average on a 50 and 200 day moving average. What did we do? We got to that 200 day moving average. We tested, we held. What is the slope of the 200 day moving average doing right now? It is trending higher. These are positive things. When averages tend to test an upward sloping moving average, that is a very positive sign. When the, sl the trend slopes down and we go back up and then test it, what do we do? We failed. We failed at a downward sloping average. Does it work every time? No. But the majority of the time, from a risk reward point of view, and that's what you want to do first and foremost, manage risk. Those moving averages have been nothing but lifesavers and trendsetters. So thank you for that question. Uh, that is one I could probably spend a lot more time, but we have three more questions to go to. And I want to talk about one sector that a lot of people have been talking about. And it's question three, the home builders, they're pulling back. Well, not so much today. Do you buy the dip or do you stay away? And I assume, and I'm making the assumption, are we worried about the home builders? Why? Are we worried about mortgage rates going up and then prices declining? Or are we looking at the home builders a little differently? Are we thinking about the millennials, uh, the millennials who are moving out at record paces, and there's actually a building shortage. So what I want to do is I want to, you know, look at the index that follows the home builders, the XHB, that is the S&P Spider Select Home Builders ETF symbol XHB. Now we look at it over a long term base. And what do I see? I, I see a lot of construction. And yes, pun intended, in this sector, we're starting to see a turn. And what am I seeing? We see what we got to today. We're, you know, let's watch this next week. Let's put this on our radar there, Mr. Keller, when you're watching on your Saturday morning with your coffee. Um, we have basically gotten back to old resistance. The stock has had a nice rounded base. It had been under pressure. If you bought these dips patiently, you're slowly getting back to a point where you may be able to see a nice rally. So let's see what it does at the $73 level. It closed. Here, it's, it's the high today was 72.68. It closed right there at that level uh, at 72.66. That's positive, a nice 4% move. Does it have follow through? Does it carry through? And then what I like to do when we talk about indexes, I like to look under the hood. So the index itself looks great, but you want to talk about individual home builders. Let's go back and look at some of the sector's components. All right, here is BLDR, Builders First Source, Inc. Stock symbol BLDR, great name. It has a similar pattern that we saw in the index itself, the XHB, but it's already broken out of it. It had a rounded base. It had resistance. It broke above. It had a gap. It's trending above its moving averages. These are positive. It's a little oversold. It's retraced. And how did it retrace? It went sideways. Sideways is positive action when you had a big move like that. Let it go sideways for a little. Maybe the moving averages keep up. But the number one stock in the home builder sector, building first source, a Dallas, Texas company, they sell to the home builders. They're, they're acting well. What else is in the index? Let's take a look. It's, you know, Pulte Brands and Toll Brothers. It, let's see Pulte. Pulte Homes, second biggest holding in the index. What do I see when I look at Pulte Homes? I see a beautiful uptrend. You know, there were no dips to buy. If we bought the one dip, this is where we buy it. Where do we buy it? At the 50-day moving average. Does it act like support all the time? No, but it's a great level in a trending stock that's trending upwards. All right. What did we see today? We saw it actually come back. It was overbought on that nice run up after its earnings. And we're starting to come back. Where are we going? Back to new 52 week highs. This is positive. Watch the action in the MACD, moving average convergence divergence. This is an indicator I love. I love my RSI. I love my MACD. A lot of people like to put too many indicators, that's their preference. That's what's great about being a technician. There's not one system that works for all. But for me, what am I seeing? I look at the RSI. It held the midpoint. It's rallying back. It's not overbought. If it gets overbought, guess where it's going to get overbought? At new highs. This is positive. And then the MACD. So Pulte Homes is the second biggest component of the index. And then let's look at the third. Uh, where is my, here we go, final bar. And like I said, I am not Dave Keller. DR Horton, there you go. DR Horton, another great home builder. Same thing as Pulte, trending up, 
you know, broke the 50, trended around it, gapped higher. We love to see gaps. And all of a sudden, we're challenging old highs. Now, these are the three biggest components of the index. Home Depot, Lowe's, Floor and Decor, the do-it-yourself companies, they've been under pressure lately. These may be the dip stocks you're talking about when we talk about home builders because they're in the index. They've started the base. They're okay. Um, but right now, if you want, I like the momentum. I like what we're seeing in the individual home builders themselves. And mortgage rates have not put a damper on things. It, it's, you know, fundamentally, it, it doesn't make sense. But technically, I'm following price and price action tells me things are looking good. So that is it for my third question. My fourth question, let's see what we're going to talk about. This is more of a fundamental question. Why are higher interest rates bad for stocks? Well, you know what? They used to be bad for stocks. In Economics 101, that's uh, what was bad for stocks. So let's take a look at uh, you know performance of the 10-year versus the S&P 500. So interest rates rise, 10-year rises. What did we see in the beginning of the year when they telegraphed? We're going to raise rates. We raised rates 10 consecutive times. Ridiculous speed. Well, the market tends to see things ahead of time. And what did we do? We sold off the 10-year rally. There was this inverse relationship. But what has been able to rally lately are growth stocks. Growth stocks are supposed to go down. They didn't. Now we're seeing a pullback, higher lows in the 10-year, rates hopefully subsiding. You know, we may raise rates June 13th, June 14th, but it looks like the end is in sight. The market is telling us it believes the end is in sight. And now the S&P 500 is rallying as it starts to come down. So the relationship is there, but it's not skewed. And then talk about the banks, the financials. Usually if it's slow and steady rate hikes, then we see the financials, the insurance stocks tend to do well. It went too far too fast. We saw crisis in the regional banks. We saw problems there. And as a result, those, bank, those, those stocks haven't done well. But if rates stabilize at this high level, Watch the regional banks come back. So that's, you know, my my more of a fundamental approach. But as we saw during COVID, we can throw some of these charts and these correlations out the window. Things changed. And now we're starting to see more of a correlation. We're trending lower. The S&P 500 is trending higher. And then the last question, we talk about liquidity. What exactly does liquidity mean? That's a great question for a guy that trades here on the New York Stock Exchange. I'm going to show you one stock. This is not where anyone would expect me to go. But when we talk liquidity, we talk about the float in the stock, average daily volume. Um, we saw a lot of stocks that don't have a strong float during the SPAC boom, during the, hey, this has a high level of short interest, doesn't have a strong float. What do you see when the stocks are liquid? You see a lot of volatility. When I talk to people that I work with, when we when I day traded uh, for a nice period of time with my friends Brian Shannon and JC Peretz, we'd be on the phone. We would avoid stocks that were illiquid, meaning there was no volume. So this stock, I, I have no idea what it is, ELTX, Elico Therapeutics, it doesn't have a strong float. When it moves, the moves are extremely volatile. You don't want to be in a stock that will trade 200,000 shares a day and go down almost 50%. Uh, 200,000 shares on a 50% move is not what I want to see. I want to see, you know, high beta names. I want to see names that you can get in and out of because if you get trapped with a position because, hey, look, it's a $2 stock. I bought 2,000 shares. Well, 5,000 shares may be your average daily volume. You could be in trouble. So as far as the liquidity question, I just wanted to use that. I was going to use the DWAX SPAC. I didn't want to, you know, ruffle any feathers, but SPACs, tend to have low float and tend to be extremely volatile. And when there's news, they, they can move. So thank you for your mailbag questions. Uh, I hope I didn't talk too fast. I have a habit of doing that, being a trader here at the NYSE for so long. Uh, keep those mailbag com questions coming. Uh, right now, what I want to focus on is our three and three and wrap up the final bar for this Friday. So let's get into our three and three. All right. So to wrap up this week's final bar, Let's go over three stocks I'm watching. I've already kind of gone over one of them in the transport, but let's talk about one that, you know, we talked about big caps making moves. We People forgot about Tesla. So let's take a look at Tesla because that one made a move today and I think we need to focus on it. So if you give me one second, we're going to pull it up. Tesla three and three, and here you go. Let's look at it first. Long-term downtrend broken. 
Okay, how did we break it in early 2023? We broke it on a nice gap and we followed through. Broke above the 50-day moving average. Yes, it's important. It's psychologically important. Where did the stock rally? Rally back to its 200-day moving average, a downward sloping 200-day moving average, and it failed. And what happened? It failed but it retraced to a rising 50-day moving averages. The 50-day, the 200 coming into play. Why do they come into play? Because algorithms are also programmed like we are. We technicians will program some of these algorithms and you will sell into a declining 200-day. You will buy into a rising 200-day. And Tesla has been very constructive. Is it overbought right now? Let's look at the RSI. It is. But what did it do today that got my attention? It's traded now four closes above the 200-day moving average. It gapped above old resistance, those old closing highs. I say closing highs because 217.65 was the high, but the closing high, it closed at a new high going back to last year. This is positive. You may see a retracement over the near term, but to me, something's changed in Tesla. You add in a little AI phenomenon, you may see it rally. I would use my 200-day moving average as a stop. I would probably buy in tranches down to it and then watch, make it go on a run to 237, 240. And then if it really gets euphoric, you may be talking 52-week highs and and above. So that's my first chart. I got to go quick. I know, I know it's three and three, and I did one in four. Uh, let's look at my other three and three chart. Um, we Oh, keeping with the Tesla theme, let's look at Kathy Wood's arc. 50-day moving average, 200-day moving average. We broke above, we closed above. A golden cross is forming. Do I buy all golden crosses? No, I do not. But for a long-term investor, something has changed. I've done deep dives under the hood in a lot of these stocks, and we're seeing more stocks in this average do well. Yes, they'll talk about NVIDIA not being in it. That stinks. She, she missed a big play. But overall, we're starting to see a series of higher lows. We held the 35 level. We broke some minor resistance here at 40 and a half. And guess what? We're trending higher. And what I like, we have a lot to reverse. Will it get euphoric again? I don't think so. I don't think this market's about to get euphoric. It feels a little bit that way today after the action we saw. But ARC is something from a risk reward point of view that I think we're good. And then the last one I wanted to hit on was the transports. And I already hit on it earlier, but watch the transportation average. That has broken minor resistance here, a near-term downtrend. And of course, I can't find it when I need to. So you can go back to like the five-minute mark and see that chart of the transports because to me, that is phenomenal. That is, uh, you know, when we're talking Dow theory, and we can do the Dow Jones Industrial Average as well in the three and three. We've got room to run. We see some positive divergences here. The, the setups are bullish. And watch the S&P, watch 4,200 now because old support or old resistance becomes support on a dip. We have a quiet week. I think momentum will continue as we go into it. And, uh, you know, those are my three and three or two and a half because we messed up the transports. But I appreciate your time. I appreciate you know, Dave, allowing me to come in and host here from my home, away from home at the New York Stock Exchange. Please make sure to follow us on YouTube, to link, to subscribe, and to use the comments. You know, please you know, bomb them. I'm, I'm going to bomb. I have a lot of questions for Dave after this week's episode. But something changed this week. The breath seems to be back. Let's see if that momentum can, can continue into next week. It's slow on the news front. The technical setups are there. We've seen some nice bases. We've seen some intermediate breakdown breakouts. Uh, if it can continue, it, it's hard not to be bullish despite being seasonally slow time. So for, for me, Jay Woods here at the New York Stock Exchange, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us on the final bar. Happy trading and have a great weekend.